So we have, um, we have uh, operations across uh, 12 countries in Europe, and now we are also growing in the Latin American market. Uh, interestingly, we're headquartered in the U.S., in Denver, even though we have no customers in the U.S. Uh, but uh, yeah, but we're a, we're a very large cable operator. Uh, UK, Germany are some of our uh, large markets. We don't operate under the Liberty Global brand. Liberty Global is an umbrella brand, uh, but we do have sub-brands in individual markets. Uh, so for example, Virgin Media uh, is probably a brand that uh, you guys are probably familiar with. So that's one of our portfolio uh, companies. Um, so that's uh, a little bit on Liberty. I um, work on the corporate investment group. Uh, we are a strategic fund. Uh, we invest largely in stuff that is relevant to our parent business and largely to the operator industry in general. So that's a pretty broad set of categories from infrastructure and communications to uh, consumer internet and media. Um, uh, VR is obviously one interesting domain that we're looking at now. I, uh, um, but anything that uh, we think can be relevant to us and where we could become a large customer in Europe uh, or any of our markets for that matter of fact in the next say two to three years after we make the investment, I think that becomes a good um, sort of lens for us to take a look at. So. Um, you know, we have, uh, we've done about um, 30, we have 30 active portfolio companies right now. Uh, we've been investing since 2009. Um, and then we uh, were five of us in the group. I'm based in the Silicon Valley. Uh, three of my colleagues are in Denver and uh, one colleague in, in Europe, in Amsterdam. Um, and then uh, lastly, I guess we, we typically work we're kind of stage agnostic from an investment standpoint, but we will, if you look at our deals, they'll normally fall, up, fall between CDs A to CDC. C. So uh, not necessarily, uh, you know, we don't necessarily need revenue as per se. We've invested in pre-revenue companies as well, but um, we'd like to see some product definition before we make an investment. Uh, it's, it's important to determine strategic fit with us. Um, and uh, yeah, we lead deals, we'll invest between uh, three to five million dollars to begin with and then support the company through the lifetime. Yeah, so Thank that's you. a great, uh, great summary. Um, and I'm really delighted that you were able to join us again. You were here last year when we first started this um, venture capital panel. And if you think about a lot of the discussion this week uh, is about where is the business model? Where is the distribution strategy? This is like a de facto distribution network globally versus just in the US, which is really interesting for, for companies here at Digital Hollywood. And then Mary Ermitanio is with the Menats um, Digital Media Group, which is the consulting arm of yeah. the firm, right? Hi, everyone. Um, I'm Mary Ermitanio, and I'm with Menat Digital. So for those of you who spend a lot of time on the 405 and the 10, you may recognize the Manat building. So Manat is a law firm, and, and it's been around for 50 years. And more than 10 years ago, we launched a venture fund, and we're, we're focused um, primarily in digital media, uh, especially in LA. We love investing in our own backyard. Um, three years ago, we launched Manat Digital, which is the business advisory arm of um, the law firm. And about a year ago, we launched an incubator. So it, it's a really unique platform. I'm part of the Manat Digital Group. Um, and I think we're really in a unique position that we're working with the established you know, traditional media companies who are experimenting in VR, looking to leverage existing IP, and we're helping them find VR content and tech companies to, to partner with and go to market with. We're also working with startups and with, with content creators who are looking for funding in the space and who um, are also looking for partners. And so the role that I play is really more in business development, and that's the lens through which I'll be sharing my thoughts during this discussion. Great. Um, so it's quite fascinating that um, I, I was at KPMG running their incubator many years ago, and uh, it was kind of very novel that a consulting firm started an incubator and it really was quite powerful because then I would say most of our new clients came through that 
route. Mm -hmm. And I feel that having a law firm that started with a venture fund and then going to consulting and then going to incubation is, is quite fascinating, but probably a really good business model for the overall Absolutely, firm. yeah. Yeah, it improves the, the overall uh, functioning. So then we have a, an early stage fund that was launched in LA here in January. Alex, you want to tell us a little bit more about Stage Venture Partners? Yes, uh, the sign here is uh, a little inaccurate. My partner, Rob Vickery, was unable to be here. So I'm Alex Rubelkava, and I will be saying most of the same things that Rob would say, only without his British accent. <laughs> but uh, we are a, um, an early stage firm. We typically invest in seed startups. We are. Uh, as indicated, based here in Los Angeles, and one of our key areas of focus is digital media and entertainment-related technology companies. Um, we probably will not uh, be doing investments into content, but we're very interested in the underlying technology that's driving new forms of storytelling and new forms of visualization forward. Uh, we. Um, we're very happy to be here at uh, Digital Hollywood. Uh, the uh, most recent publicly disclosed investment uh, that we have made was through an entrepreneur that we met here at the last event in May and uh, was basically a cold email from them because they were also going to be here. So uh, hopefully something good like that comes out of our presence here today. Yeah, that's Pi, right? That's Pi Video. Pi is uh, the leading platform for user-generated 360 video content. And their user uptake was really amazing based on everything. Their, their engagement numbers were the highest we've ever seen yeah. in the space, which is why we were so excited to invest in them. That's awesome. Well, thanks for coming again, and hopefully we'll get another portfolio company after today's I look forward session, to that. Right? That's who we're shooting for. Yes. Kellerman uh, is with a, a banking side of this, and he can t you can tell us a little bit about what's going on. Yeah. Hello, everybody. My name is Kellerman Papp, and I'm with a firm called Moreland Partners. We are a uh, technology-focused investment bank. We have uh, offices in Silicon Valley, New York, and London. Um, we do something in the order of 25 to 30 transactions a year. Those transactions are predominantly M&A, uh, but occasionally growth equity financings. Uh, and it's all 100% within the tech sector. Um, within AR, VR, um, we haven't uh, announced any transactions yet, although we have a, a few projects that we're working on in that space. And so I've personally been spending a lot of time in this area. And then Tom R. comes from Greenberg Traurig, which is another law firm locally that's doing quite quite a few deals, I would say, in addition to right. Uh, hi, uh, Tom Ara. I'm a shareholder at the global law firm of Greenberg Traurig. Um, we have about 2,000 lawyers, four continents, about 40 countries. Um, we are um, actively involved not only in the entertainment and media space, in many of our offices, but um, we have um, a VR AR practice that I am a member of and um, actively involved in. Uh, I also lead the China side of the entertainment and media practice at the firm um, with uh, representation of a number of Chinese companies investing in a variety of US-based entertainment media, AR, VR uh, opportunities and ventures. Um, and I can talk a little bit more about that when we sure, get to definitely. the panel. We're going to have a little bit of a global perspective today. I, I see I see what's shaping up here. And Mark now is with uh, Technicolor Ventures. The fund was seated outside of Technicolor. Now it's inside the company. Yeah, hi, well, guys. Uh, hi, guys. My name is Mark Linnau. Um I've been with Technicolor and Technicolor Ventures for the last uh, two and a half, three years. Um, I would say I've been probably covering VR and AR for the last three years. Um, at Technical Adventures, we did 15 investments, uh, some in uh, VR or the VR space. And right now, we're, I'm in the corporate development group, so we look at, um, we're looking at not just seed, but sort of all across the, the spectrum in terms of financing um, and uh, the life of a startup. Um, I would say that, like, uh, looking at the space, I've uh, been helping a lot of entrepreneurs outside to uh, help, you know, with their product um, strategy and capital raising strategy, and seeing sort of a lot of the different trends in the space um, that I've, like, highlighted in some publications. I've written a few articles for CB Insights, which takes really good uh, track and uh, data points for uh, 
what's going on in the VR and AR space and any actually frontier technology space at the moment. Yeah, I, I'm a big fan of CV insights myself uh, in terms of data. But let's look at the data. What does the market look like, if anyone would like to comment on it? And uh, do you agree with the projections of 120 billion and 30 billion, respectively, for AR, VR markets in the next few years? Yeah. Want me Go to ahead. start? Sure. Yes, um, um, I think uh, so. Our view is that. I th the technology is uh, is really good. I mean, uh, if you look at the VR technology, um, there are comparisons that people draw against 3D, and you know, how does it really is it really going to be successful or not? And and I think um, our view is that the technology and the sort of experience that it provides is actually phenomenally different than what we had seen with 3D. Although you could, you know, if you look at historically anything that requires consumers to put something on their face has not been really successful in the past. Um, so I think, but we're still, we like the, we like the experience. We think uh, the fact that, you know, consumers can immerse themselves and sort of be in a different place, I think is very compelling. Uh, but it is, it has its share of challenges and I think we all probably have seen some challenges or the other. I mean, largely it's around, you know, how do we get to the monetization? How do we get to the adoption rates that, uh, that would make this industry into those billion dollar industries? So uh, I, you know, the, the initial reports, obviously, uh, uh, I, I, you know, we, we think we're pretty aggressive. I think there would be some uh, refinement to the estimates. It's still a pretty large market, but you know, uh, 30 billion in 2020 and 120 billion in 2020 it seems like a stretch right now. I think, I think the challenge is the, the moment you get start getting adoption from a mass market point of view. That's when you can you can uh, deterministically sort of figure out market rates uh, a little bit better. Right now, um, if you look at uh, cinematic VR. Uh, it's or enterprise VR. Uh, I'd still call them in sort of experimental mode. I mean, there's a lot of content being developed, but still, I think content creators are learning how to produce content. It's a different way of storytelling. Uh, people are getting used to just sort of viewing content on the viewer on the headsets. I think the headsets are still largely in 2016 really going to be focused around gaming. And, um, uh, you know, uh, gaming is obviously it's one category, but it's, uh, it's still not mass market, at least from my point of view. Uh, I think mass market will come when people start using the headsets kind of like we, we have TVs in our home, right? Or maybe even mobile devices, right? I mean, we have the average household in the U.S. has, you know, 2 to 2.5 TVs. Uh, I think maybe if you have a couple of headsets per household, that sounds like massive adoption, but I think we're, we're a little bit away from that. And uh, some of it is, you know, as we develop more content, as the headsets become a little bit better, uh, I think it'll happen. So, so to answer your original question, I think the, the estimates need to be revised, frankly speaking, a little bit. Yeah. yeah. So then it seems like the market's coming, but it's the question of is it coming in, and Mayor yeah. was pointing this out earlier, is it in six months, one year, two years, five years, is there a bridge between... Right. The mass yeah, and, and if you look at most large sort of mega trends, uh, there are three aspects to it. There is the investment dollars, which go into sort of developing the market. There's the technology aspect to it. And then the last thing really is, which is sort of the most important thing, is the consumer sort of adoption and the acceptance rate of the technology. And I think, I think uh, we have seen a lot of dollars flowing in. In the last, what, five, six years, there have been like at least $4 billion yeah, of venture investments that have gone into this space. <laughs> Uh, some companies have also went IPO. I mean, there have been acquisitions. So a lot of value has been created, but I still don't think the consumer adoption, which is a third part of a mega trend, has sort of gone and become, has reached that inflection point yet. And uh, it's still largely gaming, but I think it's coming, yeah. It's coming to this market. Yeah. Um, Mary, I, go ahead. Yeah. yeah I, I mean, I agree with that. I think the numbers are going to change quite a bit over time, and it's already changed. I mean, when um, the initial projection for, for AR, VR was $150 billion, I think, by 2020, but when HTC launched 
the Vive, they readjusted the, the projection down to 120 billion. I mean, I, I, I think having those numbers is a great way to, to share with the world what the potential is for this industry, but, but it's going to change quite a bit based on the adoption rate, based on the advances in technology. There's just so many variables. I think one thing that's really interesting is that a lot of these projections are also based on how mobile adoption, um, the, the actual mobile adoption historically, but that was based on you know, Moore's Law. And what's interesting is that Intel had indicated that Moore's Law is actually coming to a slowing halt. Um, so what does that mean for the advancement of VR? Now, I don't think that v VR advancement and technology advancement is going to slow down because there are other ways that you know, companies like NVIDIA are trying to figure out how to do more with less hardware. But it just, it, my point is that the projections are going to change based on all of these things that are happening right now. Um, in terms of consumer adoption, um, I do think that, you know, th there are two different experiences I see. One is, is you have your in-home personal experience. That's your gear, that's your vibe. But then there's also these, the out-of-home location-based experiences. And that's like what, had, what IMAX had announced just recently. They're launching, you know, um, installations in theaters and in malls around the world. And I think that latter piece is really what's going to bring VR to the masses. And that, I don't think, has been taken into account with a lot of these projections. Um, so uh, location-based entertainment, that's going to be where the industry will see immediate monetization. That's also where um, a lot of consumers will encounter virtual reality for the first time, because a lot of them are not going to buy your vibes, even though the prices come down. These are really bulky headsets at this point. So they'll go, I, I see it more as, you know, almost like a theme park. They'll go to these out-of-home experiences and experience those there. So see, yeah. let's do the show of hands that you asked me to do. In this room, how many people are actually working in AR, VR? Okay, so it's most of the room. Perfect. I don't know if it's going to work, Mary. Okay, if you work in AR, VR, you can't answer this next question. <laughs> do you actually use AR, VR? headsets at home, and have you used any of the apps? Okay, that kind of tells a story. <laughs> Location-based it is. Would anyone else like to comment? I, I, yeah. Yeah. yeah, I'd like to comment Go a little ahead. bit on like the, these numbers. Um, so I think I know where the numbers you guys are talking about. You guys are talking about Tim Merrill's numbers from Digital Capital that, that say like 120 at the end. Uh, first point, the VR top line didn't change. It was 30 and uh, uh, and uh, AR was the remaining, they reduced the AR uh, to, to 90. So that's the one thing. The second point was that that was released in January. Um, playing a little bit of devil's advocate here is because I don't think thinking of VR as this isolated, isolated experience, even though it is one, but it's meant to be social, right, as a uh, reason why Mark Zuckerberg talked about, uh, you know, why he really bought uh, the Oculus. Um, so two interesting things happened uh, since like AR was, I guess, projected downwards or like redacted. Um, one was there was, a, there was an interesting acquisition of, of Luxury called uh, uh, from Snapchat. And if you guys know how much money they're actually driving per day in, um, in sponsored lenses, <coughs> it's not like real AR per se, but it is a, it's kind of a, I don't know what, how best to call it, but it's kind of AR or light AR uh, that extracts revenue from this huge user base that Snapchat has. That's one. Um, the second thing was Pokemon Go. Um, those put a lot of uh, value into the, in, into the AR market, and these things, you know, happened after that. This, and the second part about, you know, about VR is... Uh, I would say in terms of the corporate investments and the investing side, the later stage. Well, we talk about all these things like, yes, like, um, like we alluded to a lot of the later stage money is coming from follow on from corporates. And I think these are very uh, defensive in nature. Um, like, you know, it's why is uh, who, who announced recently Baobab? I think some of the telcos and some of the corporate strategics are, are invested in the latest round and they raised $25 million. I think thinking, saying that this is going to go lower is, is a kind of a, it's kind of a hedge by all the analysts that we're saying it's going to go higher or be really high. 
Um, and you, 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 know, you kind of read the tea leaves. All these corporates are investing um, when VR is you know, considered hype cycle, but it's actually progressed along the hype cycle, according to Gartner. Uh, along, it, it passed the trough of disillusionment, which means it's going to be a failing technology. So all these things kind of point towards that it's going to be a competing platform, and that's the best way to think of it if you want to think of it as the actual real market. And if everyone here who works in VR, you know, if you guys are expecting to have a job in five years in VR, I would hope for, that you guys are cheering for the market because thinking of VR as in gaming and cinematic VR is like very limited. You have to think of VR in terms of like what web was and what happened. There's a big sort of movement around web VR that just got announced, um, but it's been, if, to industry insiders, you all know about it. Making VR really distributable, really distributable, really consumable, really, you know, really scalable. Um, these are the things that, are, that's, that defines like why a, com a computing platform is very valuable and why it commands $150 million or $150 billion market, market by 2021. Yeah. That's, I think that's a great point because I've, I've said in, in panel after panel yesterday and the day before where the Hollywood community is approaching this the way we approached every new technology. Like, okay, what's the extension for my film? What's the extension for my television show? And Kelman, you sent me something from, um, uh, from, from that point of view, which is like, my storytelling is great in film and TV. Why do I need VR for storytelling? And how is that going to change my life? And here, there's some sort of a sense of like, where is the business model and how am I going to get paid? But if you start looking at it, this is the internet from like 1995. And it's going to redefine how we do everything, not just entertainment. Then as an entertainment company, you can find your place in that coordinate system and make and create business models that make sense. So, Kelman, you want to? Oh yeah, I mean, I was just going to say what I think is interesting about Mark's comment is the you know the two examples he gave of you know augmented reality or virtual reality, whichever you want to define them as. Um, neither one of them require a user to put on a headset. Um, so, I, you know, I still go back to you know how many people are going to go home at night and put on a headset to consume you know multiple hours of content in the foreseeable future. And that's what I personally really struggle with. Um, I just don't know if that's going to become a reality in the near term. Yeah, I think, uh, Kelvin, your focus on um, usage of headsets is a really good one. The, uh, when we meet with entrepreneurs, uh, the number one question that we ask uh, anyone in VR and AR is, what is your minutes of use per user per month? And the numbers uh, that uh, we are hearing are shockingly low. And um, until those numbers start to go up, it's going to be a real challenge for people. Mary, I'm glad you, that you mentioned uh, the parallels to uh, mobile adoption in uh, a lot of these industry forecasts. I would urge you to be very skeptical of any parallels to the early smartphone era, to iPhone and Android, when looking at the VR and AR market. And the reason for that is pretty simple. How many of you got your first phone and it was an iPhone or an Android? I'm going to presume the number is close to zero. Um, the iPhone and the Android market came into an existing cell phone market. Most people had had multiple cell phones over a period of years when they made the upgrade to the iPhone or to Android in 07 or 08. Today, everybody who is buying a Gear or a Vive or an Oculus or who is using it is using it for the first time. And so we are probably closer to the era of uh, you know, Michael Douglas's phone in Wall Street than we are to the era of the iPhone when it comes to mobile, or when it comes to VR and AR today. The final thing I'll say about these projections and about um, the numbers that are being associated with them is that they're leading to a lot of capital going into startups, and a lot of that capital is leading to very high burn rates. And the burn rates that we are seeing across the industry uh, are way, way, way too high. And I would encourage any entrepreneur in, um, in the VR and AR space today to really focus on survivability and sustainability. Yeah, and I'll, I'll follow up on your comment about the, you know, the, the making the, drawing the analogy to the mobile device market. Um, I, I think that there's a much greater pain point around lack of communication, persistent communication, than there is around um, uh, a, a, an immersive experience. I think that, you know, with the, you know, the, the mobile device, I mean, 
you know, try leaving your mobile phone at home and picking somebody up at the airport or meeting somebody at the mall. It's nearly impossible. How um, did we do that before? I know, <laughs> right? It seems like it, you couldn't possibly do it. So I think it solved a much greater pain point than, you know, sitting at home. And, and I don't feel like watching basketball on my TV is a broken experience. Now, could it be better? Perhaps. But I don't know that, that I'm feeling a, a pain point where it would push me today, at least, to, to, to buy a headset. Absolutely. And then there's these multi-billion dollar bets, these unicorns, right? And I sent you, I think, something about Bleepar, which is one of my favorites, personally, because it's basically taking a look at the physical space that we're in and saying that we're going to integrate that space with this space so that you don't have to kind of look, especially as I age, looking at the small screen is really annoying. So this will be accessible to you, whether it's with a goggle or with a, you know, headset or whatever that's going to look little, you know, thing in my ear or whatever it is in a couple of years. Um, this data that we actually have, that we're using, as you say, just to get to, you know, places every day and, and to, to work through our daily lives, this will be now integrated with the physical world. Do you guys see any kind of deals in this space? And where do you think that's going? Yes. <laughs> Where's uh, it going, we, uh, <laughs> we think that uh, integrating experiences uh, and the user uh, journey uh, into other platforms is what will drive engagement and minutes of use. You may be playing a game in a headset for 20 or 30 minutes um, on Saturday, but that gameplay experience can be and should be something that also lives on your desktop, on your console-based game, and on your mobile in a persistent way. And we think that cross-platform integration, both for gaming and for uh, video-related content, will be what will help to drive these user engagement numbers and these minutes of use up. And we're very eager to find uh, companies that are building the technology to make that happen. And what I was saying is that Bleepar went a step further and put their tags in 64 billion consumer products globally. Exactly. So, so you can literally scan you know, his jacket and find out where to buy it today because it's already in their database. So do you see deals in this space, Mark? Um, yeah, there's a company that Salesforce backed that mm -hmm. uh, is doing a pretty interesting partnership mm -hmm. with, uh, with Coca-Cola. So I'm not familiar with how it works when you sell vending machines to to uh, companies uh, or to small businesses that host them. But there's a company called Augment. They sell um, a visualization tool for, for putting anything in your store or storefront or in, in a physical location, right? Um, it's an AR, not VR uh, solution. But the, the really interesting thing about it is uh, that it ties to a CRM on the back end through Salesforce, which really helps them the more data they have about you, the more they can market and sell to you. Um, I think that's a really interesting sort of like use case for, for AR and VR. Another one is, I mean, just, in, just a general broad statement. Um, a lot of the banks overlooked uh, marketing being a use case for VR, and it's a pretty huge one. And if you really think about that mark, marketing advertising makes four to six percent of our GDP, that's, that's a pretty big opportunity. And you probably see some of the marketing and advertising deals in this space at Manat or... Uh, yeah, and I, I think that's where, um, you know, adoption of, of AR is, is really happening in the enterprise. So you, you already have brands using AR in their training, in, you know, simulation, and, and in marketing. So Lowe's, they have a whole mm -hmm. AR experience. Actually, it's a VR experience, but they've also recently started... Um, working with HoloLens to do an AR experience for their customers who want to come in and, and design their, old, their, their kitchen and their interior. So, and you have car dealers working with AR as well. Um, and they've also already um, announced like, ROI from the use of, of uh, AR, and I think that'll just further you know, the adoption of AR from an enterprise perspective. Yes, Tom? Yeah, the, the thing I'll note is that we're seeing that Although, you know, the U.S. has great technology, so does Korea and South, uh, and Japan, but in terms of adoption, the excitement right now here seems to be 
a lot around the entertainment aspects of the VR and AR, whereas we're seeing in other territories a lot more interest, in, in fact, adoption in consumer and commercial uses, real estate, hospitality, whatever. Um, China is one place where that's happening more than it is here, and the interest, I think, you know, is very high in how to monetize that, um, you know, in, in territories outside of the U.S. Yeah, we, we looked at some technology out of Korea that's very much like bleep bar, right? And interestingly enough, you know, as I looked at it, I thought, well, gosh, this is <laughs> competing with a unicorn in Europe. This is a great idea. It should be funded. It should be developed. They thought of it as just connecting the dots on a physical label to the, you know, to the mobile device. And there's really not that thinking, I would say, globally that we have here in the U.S. in terms of development of these markets. So do you see that as sort of the, I would say, core competency that you guys bring to the table to the Asian market? Well, look, I think the, at the end of the day, a lot of these experiences have some content component to it, right? There's some kind of a storyteller involved. And that's, by the way, that's something that most of our uh, international partners envy us for. We're great storytellers and we're great at creating content. And look, I mean, what's happening in the film and television business with Asia and China in particular coming into the U.S. is a lot about that. Um, you heard uh, Wang Jianlin, who spoke earlier this week at an event I was at, talking about, you know, adopting the storytelling of, you know, Hollywood. Um, and I think a lot of that trickles into this. Uh, you know, maybe creating tags isn't storytelling, but there's a lot more to that when you talk about, uh, you know, the experience. And so I think um, we have to continue to foster and, and, and build that and covet that. Yeah, because Silicon Valley is about packaging just as Hollywood is, just packaging in a different way. That's right. I think on, on the AR side, I just maybe one last comment on the AR side is just, uh, I think the technology for AR is just a lot harder. It's just a, and it's, it's a few steps behind, I think, the VR technology. It's just a harder problem to solve. Uh, the applications are not necessarily entertainment applications. There are all sorts of business applications that you can imagine. You can think of email, any sort of app that we use on these phones today that would be very relevant to an AR type of uh, a platform. Um, and But just getting the initial optics right, I mean, there is obviously there is the issue of the, the headsets become, being bulky and not necessarily very social as per se. Uh, but apart from that, it, just getting the resolutions, the optics right, I think it's going to have, there's going to be a little bit of a, a time to get before companies get that right. And there's a reason why Magic Leap and, and some of these companies have raised so much money, because it's a hard problem to solve. They need the, the 12 to 18 yeah, months runway. Yeah, I mean, runway. it's, it's, just, yeah. it's, just, it's, a, it's a very hard problem to solve. Yeah. And uh, I think uh, the, the, uh, while on the VR, we're starting to see really good quality displays. I mean, it's still probably, you can't compare it to maybe a 4K television, but it's getting there. I think it's, it's, it, it's, it's in that evolution step right now. Uh, but on the air side, I think the technology is still a few steps behind where, before we can say it's ready for mass adoption. So it's even a little slower process to adoption. Yeah. But it's a bigger platform. I mean, there, yeah. I mean to me, I feel, VR is more, more so like a, you know, a, a complementary add-on to like a television at home, whereas an AR headset would be something that would be more like you know, a mobile device like a phone. So I can imagine once these technologies do become mainstream, you know, we all have, everybody in the household has one phone, at least I would think now, and I would think they would probably have some kind of an AR device like that. Uh, but, the, you know, on, on a VR headset, it could be maybe one or two per household. Yeah. And that's really interesting because there's this whole idea of mixed reality that keeps coming up, which is like, <coughs> and as we were, I think, talking earlier about, you know, cross-platform, but really kind of cross-physical world to the digital world. Do you guys see any companies developing in that space? Um, so we have we've seen uh, companies doing social VR, so that's somewhat of a cross, I think. And actually, going back to Mark's point, I think uh, one of the problem, if you draw an analogy of VR with like the web, 
the internet really became popular and really became mainstream once you, it started having social applications mm -hmm. on it. You know, before, think about it, before Google and Facebook, I mean, it was there, but the, the, the adoption really started taking, uh, you know, becoming mass market once there was a social aspect to it. So I think that is, uh, we think that that's actually a pretty important part of, of getting uh, VR and AR uh, mass market. So they are, we have seen technologies that are now trying to, you know, bring a social element to it. Uh, it's again very early. There's the usage of avatars to do that. The avatars that are today are maybe not very good, but if you, there are experimental avatars where you would find it very hard to now, you know, distinguish between uh, like a real person and his avatar. It's actually pretty, it's, it's, it's getting yeah. very, very close, yeah. I'd like to clone myself, so I can't <laughs> wait for that time <laughs> to happen. Go yeah. ahead, Mike. Oh, no, no. No, okay. So I think, well, um, another maybe interesting thing would be to see where the audience would like to take this discussion. So how many people in the audience are raising money for an AR, VR company? Okay, a few. Um, do you guys have any questions for the panel? Are they a good fit, maybe? Go ahead. <laughs> uh, yeah, my question is, uh, with respect to content, which really hasn't been discussed too much today, VCs are typically allergic to content and content plays. <laughs> uh, so what is your perspective on how VCs and agents will invest in content, and how much your prognostication on what content is with VR in the next few years? I think it depends on the, the investor. So um, Comcast Ventures is, is actually investing he pretty heavily in AR, VR content. Um, I think you just need to, to, to find the right uh, type of investor. It sounds like you guys are more on the technology side, but you'll find some that will, you know, will invest. And they probably have some media angle to them um, as, as a Comcast or, or others. Actually, Anchor, I'm curious how you guys think about I mean, you guys are in the content world. Um, so, yeah, well, <clears throat> so we have, so we've not done any uh, uh, sort of VR content related investments yet. But, yeah, we're open to it. I think the challenge is, again, how do you maintain, uh, you know, a level of burn that's going to let you sustain through uh, the adoption curve. Uh, content is really a key integral part of the adoption curve. Without the content, I think it's going to be, uh, it's going to be hard to get those adoption rates happen, but uh, uh, but yeah, I think there are some VCs. I mean, they're definitely funds like Comcast. We know the Comcast guys very well, and uh, because they are so close to NBC, uh, they're obviously investing in in content companies for sure. Yeah. Um, you know, when you look at the the VR stack, you have. Uh, you, you have the hardware, right? The peripherals, the distribution, or the, the points of aggregation, where you know, like the app stores, and then you have the applications, the content on top of that. If we look at the wave of investments, I feel like the first wave was really into the hardware, so Facebook and Oculus and, and Microsoft investing into the Hololens. Um, I think what we'll start to see is is now that we have this hardware is investment into content, and I think the strategics that those who who know and who get content will be leading will be leading those investments, like the Disney investing in Jaunt or the Comcast. Um, I also think another source of funding would be the headsets themselves, right? The, the, they're funding, they're, they're spending a lot of money in building these headsets, so they're also investing in the content that would go on them. I mean, in, in the Oculus Connect conference recently, Oculus just announced another 250 million that they would be investing and committing to funding. Um, there is, um, you know, Vive has Vive Studios, they're funding content, they're, they have the Vive Accelerator. Um, there are a bunch of other funds really that have come together, the VR, VCA, that have committed $10 billion, which is a staggering amount of money into really growing the VR ecosystem. I think those are sources of funding. I think China is really interesting. Um, so Baofeng, one of the headset manufacturers, they, in Q1 of this year, they announced that they sold a million headsets right, through their brick and mortar stores in China. Um, and they were targeting 10 million for 2016. And so that's, that's a lot of headsets. They're seeing a lot of, I think there's a big VR hardware boom in China. And um, I think there's opportunity there uh, because they're all looking for content as well. 
So on, on just uh, one yeah. quick note, on the Liberty side, so we do uh, invest, uh, like we have investments in uh, Formula E and some of the larger uh, uh, sporting uh, networks. And we are looking at potentially uh, looking at uh, trying to invest or trying to find companies who could potentially develop uh, uh, VR or content for like those sporting categories uh, particularly. I think sports VR is also, it's different than cinematic as you can imagine, but I think it's an interesting category, uh, particularly for certain, certain sports. Yeah. I mean, content for us is the crux of what our our practice kind of starts with. Um, we cross over with our technology group that deals with the technological side of it, but I mean, I can't tell you how much we're talking, I mean, on a regular basis because the overlap is constant. And, you know, we, you know, we're involved on a regular basis um, representing the producers of content or the licensors of the ideas or the formats or the underlying work behind the content um, in these deals uh, where they're looking to, whether it's a studio property from a major film studio or television or video game, um, we're seeing this constantly and it's really become an important part of um, are what we're doing um, and you know we're, we represent the Pokemon company so we've actually been very involved in everything that they've been doing and the repercussions of some of that as well um, good and bad uh, but um, you know we're, we're seeing content becoming kind of a central character in how this is all playing out domestically and internationally yeah I think sort of echoing other people's points here um, I've heard of a lot of different content uh, companies in VR space raising money and have actually helped one and help them pivot into it But like the story they tell is very different. I mean one you either have differentiated IP or you have access to it um, Two, you in the future are some kind of aggregation distribution point for this content and You know, I think a, another thing that you're noticing is some of these guys that are X um, studio or X uh, Pixar or whatnot guys are being able to raise that because they maybe could be like Baobab and build the next Pixar of VR. Um, and, you know, so I think you have to compete along different dimensions versus just being a production, like, like sort of services company where you just, it's a studio model where you can't really scale your business. You have to have something unique and uh, a competitive advantage to like just being that because we've already seen, everyone over here, everyone has already seen that. Um, if you look at all the startups that, that were raising money in Los Angeles that are, there's a trend, right? That they start off as like VR content companies and now they pivoted into being distribution platforms. <laughs> and why? Because that's what garners VC investment. And also when you start thinking about the, the business, the film, television, games, it's a hit driven business. So you can't really create a business around one idea, one story, couple of stories. It has to be a portfolio. And then once you get to the portfolio thinking, then you go, but the studios really are big marketing machines that spend money. Who are the companies? Oh, the companies that Encore has, you know, that distribute all that. They make the money. It's the distribution network. So then you go, okay, I need to be a portfolio and I need to have a distribution network. So once you start going through all of that thinking, there's kind of like one type of company that gets funded that is in, in our space, and that's the company that has both production and distribution and, and marketing capabilities. Or if your investor can offer you, uh, sees your IP as being very valuable and they can distribute it, that happens quite a bit. I mean, you see what AOL and Verizon is doing, um, and they've divulged a lot of their, their strategy around why they're doing content deals, and you know, some people in China are looking to get uh, some equity stakes in studios here. So there's a lot of reasons for that. Yeah, Baidu just launched a $3 billion fund from their corporate arm and a $200 million venture fund. They're the largest search engine in China, competing with Alibaba and Tencent on the you know, public market side. So there's some big, big strategics uh, and all, I would say all sizes strategic companies that are chasing this next generation of computing space. And once you understand that, then you can position your digital 
digital distribution company, digital studio in Hollywood to be poised for venture capital type investment. Yeah, one more thing, I think on the content side, um, this is a different type of content. It's a different type of storytelling. So I think even content producers and directors have to go through a certain amount of training and understanding what really is going to work for the consumer here. I mean, if you recall the early DVDs, they used to have sort of have the consumer be able to select angles and viewing angles. And a lot of that actually went away very fast because I don't think consumers really figured out the best way to do that. And I think over a period of time, as uh, content is coming up in smaller companies, I think if you uh, are able to distinguish yourself by some research or some, some way which kind of indicates that, okay, this particular way of producing content is going to be much better than, you know, uh, some, some other way. I think that that's going to be a, a potentially attractive way to get some investment dollars as well. Yeah, producing and aggregating, I think. Yeah. And then ultimately distributing too. Yes. There's, a, there's a potential to have a core Correct. competency in yeah. any of them or all three. Yeah. yeah so so thoroughly in, in anti-Trump fashion. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so I want to ask you uh, how the investment community views Um, I'll keep my answer short. I mean, I think China loves it. Mm -hmm. um, it's they, they've already got you know they. That's one thing I think the difference is between here. Someone said someone said this really intelligently, and it's like the capital comes from America, but the local the the market is in China due to that very reason. Oh yeah, the the actual adoption. Yeah, yeah. I mean they've got this is how many million internet cafes and things like that. They, it's a different sort of like culture out there for what the, the kind of entertainment they consume. The, the interesting thing about, uh, about the China market for that is that we have seen um, usage-based pricing there that uh, I think is, uh, I mean, honestly kind of astonishing and quite high. I mean, I've met with numerous companies that uh, have uh, revenue streams from China that are uh, monetizing right now at uh, $60 an hour per experience. And I mean, that's an, that's an incredibly high price. And I think that there are a lot of people who uh, are willing to pay $60 an hour for an experience once, but I don't think that drives repeat usage and repeat engagement. And I believe for that to happen, the price has to fall by at least 90%. So this is really becoming a global <laughs> investment market, right? Most of the discussion today centers about some sort of a, a, a critical advantage in the global market. It seems to me that everyone I talk to that's outside of the U.S. with a great technology wants to have some demonstrable uptake in the U.S. and then vice versa that the adoption in other countries could drag companies out of the U.S. So how are you working? Is this part of your investment strategy? Are you looking at global technologies or are you focusing on the U.S. market today? Well, we, we look at stuff that would eventually become relevant to our markets in Europe. Uh, but, uh, you know, whatever becomes relevant in Europe would largely has a pretty global footprint in general. So most of our investments actually are companies that are here in the U.S. Uh, we typically become sort of the first and first customer or, you know, an early customer in Europe. Uh, but yeah, it's most, I mean, the, the phenomena is, I mean, AR, VR is very global. So we're looking at content that would be maybe localized to some of our markets, but at least all the technology infrastructure and the, the distribution channels to actually distribute those technologies, the, the content is all going to be globalized. So we're, yeah, we're, most of our uh, companies are generally pretty global. Mary, what about the consulting clients that you guys look at? Are they U.S.-based, global? So we, we represent, in, I mean, content creators here in the U.S. are also looking for funding, and, and, and what we're doing for them is, is really, 
I mean, we're, we're talking to brands, we're talking to the HMDs, and, and that's part of sort of my answer to your question earlier. Um, we are also speaking with um, investors internationally who are looking for content. And all of this is really was baked into my answer to the previous question. Um, international uh, investors looking for content here in the US. So, and what I think is interesting specifically for location based is that that's sort of the area that they're looking um, for content for. So we were speaking with some Japanese investors and they weren't interested in, in um, you know, content for specific for, for the vibe or, or bring the vibe over but they were looking at their karaoke bars and how they can bring content into karaoke bars and internet cafes there so yeah so, so so i think they're far ahead in terms of location base and i think that they see that's where adoption is going to happen first and foremost yeah. we're, we're actually seeing some of that activity here in the u.s um there's a lot of discussion around empty space at some of our mega malls and what to do with that. Um, so you don't have to go to theme parks. There, there are locations just down the street from many of our homes and offices where there may be opportunities for location-based um, VR and AR, or VR primarily experiences. And we have clients that are actively exploring that with um, operators of some of these locations. Hmm. Very interesting. And these are basically retail shopping mall developers who have money right. and want to be part of the right. brave new world. That's right. Smart. That's Very right. Smart. Well, if you have, I mean, look, if you've lost a big tenant like a Macy's or yeah. whatever, mm -hmm. you know, what are you going to put in that space? You could hope for another major tenant or think outside the box and try something different. That may give you more revenue per square foot than a retail Correct. company can. So you have to show the numbers that are better than Macy's sales, for example, in your business plan. Right. That's a great tip if you're in location-based VR. <laughs> so let's get down. Now I'm going to put you guys on the spot a little bit. I mean, first of all, thank you for preparing so thoroughly for the panel and for giving us amazing overview kind of market analysis. Brings me back to business school, you know, as we, as we go through the SWOT analysis here. But if you have a deal that you're showing to one of you guys, what would it take in terms of the, the actual financial modeling, you know, components of that deal? Do you have to have user uptake that's X? Do you have to take, have Y million in revenue? Do you have to be in a X many billion of the growing market. What are some sweet numbers that you think people should think through as they put their financial models together that are fundable versus well, not fundable? Um, as, a, as a seed investor, I view financial models that go out beyond about a year to be mostly okay. fiction. And so, <laughs> That's uh, one year only. So they're not really all that relevant for, uh, for seed <laughs> investing. Um, you know, at the, at the stage of investing that we do, um, what matters most is a company raising enough money to be able to hit milestones for future financing. Okay. And so if you are raising seed capital, you know, sometimes we see people who raise seed capital, we ask, well, how long is that going to last? And they, they say six months. And we say, do you really enjoy fundraising that much? <laughs> um, because it, it's, uh, that's just, Things always take longer, things always cost more, and you want to give yourself the opportunity to put your head down and work for a year or a year and a half or more and get stuff done so that by the time you're raising your next round, you're raising an up round, you have made progress, and you are showing signs of traction and product market fit in a way that will enable you to raise a series A. So is it 18 to 24 or 12 to 18? What's as much it? time as you can buy yourself. So 18 to 24 as sounds As much time as you can buy okay, yourself cool. will help. Uh, right, keep so those bird rates low. <laughs> this is your assumptions page, okay. Yeah. Uh, um, billion markets, I mean, these markets are all multi-billion. I mean, we, we're not, we're not, we're not gonna find a $5 billion market. It used to be the old uh, minimum size. Yeah, of course. I think for us, um, <clears throat> uh, we typically, uh, I mean, we call ourselves stage agnostic, but we look at our deals, they typically end up between Series A and C. Um, most of our companies do have an operating model that you could look at, but again, maybe not a year, but two years after that, we start off saying, okay, that, you know, it's all fictional anyway. So I think for us, what really is important 
is uh, the technology and the ability to have to defend it. Uh, you know, whether it's through patents or whether it's uh, uh, core, you know, engineering team. It could be first mover advantage in, in a lot of cases. In which case, we would look at numbers uh, on usage and and adoption rates and and and, and the likes. Uh, but in the case of VR and AR, I think we are obviously the markets are still pretty early to to make any meaningful sense out of uh, like usage rates right now. I think what is more important for us, and if we were to, we are to look at a, a, a business plan around the VR and AR market, I think we'd really look at what would be defensible um, and something that can basically produce uh, a technology in, you know, in the four to five year type of range. So three to uh, five year plan yeah, is exactly, kind of more yeah. standard at Series yeah. A and post. Yeah, yeah. so the, the, you know, the financial models are good, I, but I think more than the top line, we'd be concerned about what sort of cash infusion does the company need over the next three to five years. So the burn, uh, that's important, and obviously how defensible the technology would be. You know, the barriers to entering it. What, one thing I would add about yeah. just you know financial projections and market size. If you are having to convince an investor that you're pitching that you're attacking a high market, you're pitching the, uh, that you're attacking a big market, then you're pitching the wrong investor. And so we almost always just skip any discussion in uh, in our meetings with entrepreneurs about the size of the market. If we don't already know it's a large market, you're pitching the wrong folks. Makes sense, especially this, these markets are just huge. Yeah. What about um, any more um, to add to that, Mark, as they come to see you? Like, what shouldn't they do? <laughs> what shouldn't they do? Yeah. Well, I mean, I don't know about what shouldn't they do. <laughs> <laughs> but, what should they do? <laughs> but I like, I gravitate. I mean, there's a few, in the, let's talk about seed stage, first of all. I've probably only seen five or six deals in the space that have actually been profitable um, at this stage and just need you know more capital to to grow to scale that business but also in this area you're looking at how awesome is the team do you have a history of success what are your customers saying i would say like beyond not just like how much i think it's it makes sense like yeah to ask them how much customer acquisition costs you and what you, what you think your lifetime value of that customer will be. But I think at this stage, I look more like, are you, is your retention of customers really high? Do they, are they happy with you and your, because that gives me a level, gives, that gives me some comfort on whether or not you have like, you've really found some product market fit. Um, I think for later stage things, it's different. Um, if, you know, if some of us are, are working at, at uh, we do corporate investments, so strategically this is aligned with us. and. You know, it's true. Like we don't look at your projections aren't the the Excel model that I have to dig through all the time. Isn't I don't I never believe it for one, for one. So I always discount it. <laughs> and the, and the second thing is, um, you know, is it is it aligned with us strategically? If we buy something or if we acquire something or if we invest in something, does this lead to something for us strategically? that will enhance us or augment our position or augment one of our business units. Um, that's, really, that's pretty important to me. So you have to really, I think, yeah, we're almost out of time. So you have to really research your investors and sort of understand what their overall goals are, what they told their limited, what they told their you know, parents, strategic companies in terms of a fit, how is that going to work for them? And just, just one quick note to add, and I think it's important, and this is you know, well, feedback that we've gotten as we've gone out and, and, and brought our clients to various investors, and, and feedback that we've given as we've seen um, you know, pitch companies, we, we do invest in seed in early stage, is that at this very early um, phase of the industry where you're not seeing a lot of the traction with customers. It's, it's the team that really matters. So really spend time building a really good and valuable team. If you look at the, the investments in content companies that have happened in Baobab and, and VRC, they have an incredible team behind the company. And, and I think that's what's important is, is that we can be confident that you can execute in this new medium. And if maybe you don't have that on your, on your startup management team, maybe you recruit that or kind of 
recruit them with, you know, if you raise the next round, kind of bring them from your advisory board, et cetera, so that you have that track record. All right, so what is the last takeaway? Because we're at the end of our time. I'm so sad that we got to this point, but maybe each one of you just for like one sentence or two, what you're looking at in this space, you know, what the entrepreneurs could maybe talk to you about, or maybe what's the biggest takeaway in the ARVR market for your company right now. Either of those two would be great. Um, yeah, sure. I, I think for me, uh, you know, things around uh, social VR, I think, is very interesting. Uh, I'd love to hear any thoughts around that. Um, uh, plus, I mean, you know, I, I'm, I'm, I'm pretty, pretty bullish on the technology and the market. I think it'll take its time. So obviously, you know, uh, companies need to be careful and and mindful of their burn, so it gives them more and more runway. Uh, but uh, but I do like it. I think uh, I think the social aspect is going to be very interesting for me, Great. and uh, I'd love to hear any thoughts around that. Mary, um, I guess just what I think the market needs right now is really, you know, as fast as we can get to a point where where we have a lightweight, effortless, very natural headset or device that we can work with to experience this content. I want to get to a point where I can experience your fifth gen Vive type of content in, you know, in this, in the Snapchat spectacle. Still drink your beer while you're watching Exactly. <laughs> <laughs> Alex, that's great. Alex? Yeah, I would say we don't have any particular or specific technologies that we're looking for. We're just looking for ideas that drive user engagement. Anyone who comes to us and can show that their early users are coming back onto their platform every day, every week, that they're spending long session times and things like that, that's what gets our attention. Great. Kalman? I, I would say that, you know, for all of the entrepreneurs out there who are trying to build something in the AR, VR space, my, my view, and you can probably tell from my comments already, is that this market is still a long ways off from real mass market adoption. Um, and therefore, I believe that we'll see another business cycle before you actually see a, a real market out there for, for, uh, um, for revenues, for businesses and profits. And so <clears throat> my advice would be, um, you know, really think hard about your, your fundraising and, and, and how um, if the market does take another downturn uh, before there's a, a, you know, a, a true market for your product, uh, how can you weather that? Um, and be, you know, be prepared for you know for a long cold winter. Tom. By the way, I have to say your webcasting has been effective because I've already received two emails. Yay. <laughs> People <laughs> watching. They liked their comments uh, <laughs> or your comments. Or everyone got one. They just haven't checked their emails. Yet. <laughs> I'll check now. Um, from our perspective, um, we see this opportunity globally, um, and we think our clients should as well. Um, and. Uh, just as we're seeing that globalization and have been seeing in the kind of traditional entertainment industry, we think that that is exactly where we want our clients to be with AR and VR. Um, and our focus is certainly not only on the technology, but on the content. And we think great storytellers, great owners of great content will have a lot of lucrative opportunities. We think it's just the beginning. Terrific time. Mark? Um, I would take a look at what's going on in web VR. That sounds crazy. Um, that's my advice. Um, and if not, look at your business as something that could be scalable, um, distributable, headset agnostic, and really easy to consume and to share. Um, I would also say think of VR as a platform, not this gaming device. That's why I say really take a look at what's going on in web VR and all the efforts that Mozilla, Oculus, and Google are putting into it. This may solve a lot of the problems that we are sort of, we, we talk around in circles um, for why VR is not taking off. Well, thank you so much. Great comments. Uh, I learned a lot. I hope you guys have. Thank you. Thank you to the panelists. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you. Good job. Thanks for coming.